I was 21, uh, going on 22. Uh, I had uh, a fairly long hair. I was I was rather na a naive youth, and I I'd come over here from the south of England, where I'd been sort of uh, looking for work in the cinema ever since I graduated. Because even though I had a maths degree, I I, I only wanted to work in cinema because I I I'd loved the cinema from very early age. I, I was very committed to the idea that uh, the, the cinema was what, ma what one of the things that made life really worth living, and I still think that. Well, QFT had actually been founded by Michael Emerson and Michael Barnes about, about six months before I arrived. I arrived in March 1969. When I arrived on the scene, you see, it was Michael Barnes and Michael, ba uh, and Michael Emerson and Michael Open. So there was a, sort of these silly phone calls uh, where you'd sort of say, hello, Michael, it's Michael here. Michael asked me to <laughs> da 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 uh, And, uh, you know, we've had several other Michaels in the, in, in, uh, that have gone through the cinema in the past. And uh, it was a question of, uh, you sort of, you don't have to be called Michael to work here, but it helps, you know. Well, I, I, I arrived in a, a sort of um, a, a rather dark and dingy night. Uh, somebody uh, sort of met me um, from, I think, the bus station and said, oh, we'll take you to the film theatre now. And I arrived in, and amazingly, there was this old, old man, must have been in his 90s, and he was being uh, interviewed uh, he was a Frenchman, and he was talking about the, the really the very beginnings of cinema. Uh, and I was completely astounded when I discovered that he was André Méliès, who was the son of Georges Méliès, uh, and uh, he used to make magic films. Um, some of them became quite famous. The, the Voyage to the Moon is, is the most famous of them. And I was staggered that this man was, was there, and it was great, and it was... I always thought, you know, that everything I did after, uh, afterwards, uh, you know, I wanted to, to keep a, a closeness to the very roots of the cinema. QFT uh, then was not like QFT now with this sort of grand portico on, on the, on the uh, very elegant uh, Georgian Square of, of uh, as it is at present, but it was had uh, its entrance in a little uh, street called University Square Mews, which ran between Botanic Avenue and University uh, Street. Uh, and there were t two dog legs, and it was dark. There was, there was frequently there was n no street lighting, and and even when there was street lighting, it wasn't t it, it, it wasn't very good, and you couldn't see QFT from either end. Of, of the street and you were, used to walk up and then we had this uh, rather nice yellow um, uh, sign, vertical sign standing outside the place just said QFT. I used to say that we had uh, our way of uh, keeping up the, uh, uh, the sort of intellectual level of our customers was that uh, you needed to have A-level geography to find it. We had to actually um, change the cinema from being a lecture theatre to a cinema every night uh, because the screen wasn't there during the daytime because there were lectures in the, in the auditorium. So it looked almost like a cinema when you went in, apart from the fact that when you sat down, instead of having plush 
soft seats. They were, they were seats which were designed to keep students awake during lectures. It was crazy, but I think people actually rather loved it because it was so quirky and unlike anything else they'd ever seen. What we were trying to do was we were, were trying to show people that, that basically the cinema is a kind of, a film is a kind of dream. When you're watching a film, in a way, you're privileged to be sharing the dream of someone else. As far as I'm concerned, the experience of watching a film is exactly like having a dream. When you dream, what effectively you do is you dream a film. There is this wonderful thing about the cinema that, that you go from a real world into film world and it and, and the gradual things, the lights go down and the curtains open. And suddenly this wonderful spectre appears in front of you. And it, this spectre is a dream. And that is really what the cinema is. It's this dream that we're watching. And, and we were, were very, very keen to, to, to keep the dream experience and actually that has been accepted in the design of cinemas because you have to go through a series of doors to get into a cinema and it's as though you're leaving reality behind and you're going into this wonderful world of cinema. And one of the things that was really very frustrating to me when, when I was running QFT is that uh, on those occasions that we had TV um, um, companies wanting to do a little feature about something that we were doing, they would come and they would want to interview me or somebody else and they would always want to go into the projection box. And I would say, no, I don't want you to go into the projection box because the projection box is an exposure of the artifice of cinema. The people in the auditorium want to be protected or should be protected from the physicality of what is going on. Us professionals, we know what it is, but the people... There, they are only interested in the dream, not how the dream arrives. The, the sort of works that we were showing uh, were very uh, variable and, and some of them very wonderful. What was, uh, the, one of the most successful that we showed was um, a film called Deep End by Joseph Skolomowski, a Polish filmmaker, but he made it in London. Uh, it starred Jane Asher, and that was very, very popular at QFT. And... I, regard, I, I think it, it, it's really something of a classic of its, of its era. At the same time, I think uh, f for our international cinema, probably the a couple of films by Godard were, the, were, the, were, were, were among the most important. We, we showed a, a, had a huge number of people who went to see Weekend on an associates-only basis, but we also showed a great film called Two or Three Things I Know About Her. It was a film about a, a woman um, living in Paris and it is a very uh, spectac spectacularly visual work. And a lot of people came along to see that. One of the things I'm most proud of is that we showed uh, Ohasar Balthazar, which is probably the greatest film by Robert Bresson. We showed it for just three days. So it'll be six screenings, two, sh two shows a night for three days. And we had over 600 people. Now, this is a very difficult film one would have to say and and we because i regarded it incredibly highly and as a as a, a wonderful wonderful work i i promoted it really highly and it was great some people did find it difficult but a lot of people i would say probably 50 to 100 people came out of that screening and when i was outside they said because i'd said you know this is probably the greatest film you'll 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 see this year and they said, you're absolutely right, it, it, it is, it's just wonderful. And that really gave me a wonderful sense that I had achieved something. And that's, you know, what I, in all these dark days and the depression that, that, that I would have if things were going badly and everything, I always used to, 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 to cling on to the fact and, and stick by this notion that our remit was to show films that people would not, that they would watch today and forget tomorrow but but they would li they would would live in their memory and their their heart and they would remember that film to the day that they died and when people would mention the film's title they might not remember they saw it at QFT it wasn't important that they remember but they would say yes 
that was an important thing that I saw when I was whatever age, age they were. As I say, I arrived in March 69. Bernadette Devlin became elected as a member of parliament a few, few weeks later, and then there was bombings of the Silent Valley Reservoir. And within six months of my arriving, the whole balloon went up. And coming from sort of leafy Kent in south, south of England, I, this was even more devastating to me, I suspect, that it was to, to local people who at least were aware of, of the origins of, and, uh, and some of the causes of, of the problems. The fact is that, that, that it was also devastating to the cinema industry here because, you know, with uh, riots, I mean, the, 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 the first of the bad things were a lot of riots in Belfast. And people would, th would have to think twice before going out of an evening. But there were a lot of shootings and bombings. and it was, we, well, Everybody knows that, that it was how bad it was. But uh, for somebody who's working in an industry where people need to go out at night, you know, there, there were dark days when uh, one would... Uh, uh, open the cinema and have the staff come in and everybody would be there and uh, the, the cinema, the film used, used to start at quarter to seven almost invariably and it would be 20 to seven and nobody had arrived and, and I would go out and look up and, up and down the, the, the mews and nobody was coming. You know, no matter how frustrating it was for me, one, one understood it. Because, for example, there were several. I, I can't, there was some trouble over in East Belfast uh, uh, one evening, and uh, I remember going out of the the door of the old QFT at the back on the University Square Mews, and uh, you listen to them bucka 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 bucka, and there was a machine gun going on. And you think, well, if you're going out to go to the cinema and you, and you go out of your front doors and you hear bucka bucka bucka, you're going to turn around and you're going to go back in, and that wasn't just hurting QFT. Of course, it was hurting all of the cinemas. And when I arrived in Belfast, I think there were about 22 or 23 operating cinemas. But, you know, within two or three years, I'm sure about seven or eight of those at least had closed. The cinemas just found it so difficult to continue attracting people when people were scared to go out at night, effectively. And that was tragic. There were some lovely cinemas that closed. Well, basically what kept us going was that the belief in what we were doing. We were in the very, very fortunate situation of, of being able to show these great works. We were giving people in Belfast, really, the opportunity to see something beyond the horror that was, that was unfolding in our midst. In that era, there were a lot of changes going on in society and a lot of changes going on in the cinema, and particularly uh, in the representation of sex, sexuality on the, on, uh, in the screen, on the screen. And subsequently, there were, um, following uh, sort of my arrival, there were, every so often, there were films that uh, were very controversial publicly, and, and we, we showed them. For example, there was a film, I Am Curious Yellow, which was a sort of soci quasi-sociological Danish film which had a certain amount of male nudity in it. Kifty got a bit of a, a reputation for this, but the point is that we didn't, you know, we, uh, I, I hope it goes without saying, I, wouldn't, I, I wasn't interested in showing pornography. I was only interested in showing things that were interesting cinematically, which just happened to be that. And really the big, it, the big thing that it came down to was actually um, Last Tango in Paris. And that became a huge uh, issue in, in Belfast. It was, it was an issue all around Europe, wherever it was shown. And, in, and, and to me, it's a masterpiece. You know, some of these films I wasn't that bothered about and I would have said, well, if we can't show it, we can't show it or whatever. But I was really passionate about this, and there was a whole to do, as you can imagine, a lot of uh, deeply religious people thought that, that the world was going to come to an end if we showed it. And I, 
I said basically, you know, normally, you know, I, I might chicken out of doing something, but on this film, I'm prepared to go to jail for it because it's such a wonderful film. When we did show the film, we had a good bunch of uh, placard holding Presbyterians standing outside the cinema, but I always regarded that as great advertising, basically. <laughs> you know, the, the, in, with a film that is challenging, like Last Tango in Paris, inevitably not everybody liked the film. And there were people who objected to it. I think, frankly, the, the, my attitude to, to all these things were that actually if we showed an obscure film that had a lot of sex in it and people came along to see it and were offended, I was rather sad because uh, I thought maybe we hadn't uh, explained what, what it was like. But when you get a film that is getting the headlines all around the world uh, for, for, for its representation of, 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 of some aspects of sexuality, nobody can sort of say that they didn't know what they were getting. And if they come along and they get offended, I just say, well, um, you knew what Last Tango, uh, what, what, what its reputation was. Why on earth, if you were likely to be offended, why on earth did you come along? As simple as that, really. The, the issue of language for cinema, verbal language for cinema, is, is, is always slightly difficult because when you're watching a film uh, and you're, uh, if, if it's in a foreign language, you have to have subtitles and you have to read them. And some people don't like that. But to me, that is actually a matter simply of learning. You know, once you've learned to read the subtitles uh, and you don't think about it, we always simply said to people that really every film is made to, to appeal to, to, to people in, in the country that it's made and, and the people have got the same emotions in those countries that we have here. And so they can actually get uh, the same sense of emotional engagement in a film that is in a different language that they can in English. And eventually... And not, every, not everybody, of course, uh, there are lots, still lots of people who don't like the idea of watching films with subtitles. But, you know, we kept at it. We had to. We wanted to. Because the idea that we could only show films that were made in English was restricting us, was, was preventing us from showing some of the most wonderful films. I think, in a strange way, I was, at the end of the time I was here... I got rather, I was rather, I felt slightly restricted by the, 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 the idea that people thought that QFT was for foreign language films because as far as I was concerned, we were simply for great films. The quality of a film is nothing to do with the language in which it's made. You know, it can be about a lot of things, but it's not about the language in which it's made. Um, there is no language which it is impossible to make a great film in. You know, I mean, I come from a, a very lower working class family and I want every, every section of society to, 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 to get the joy out of cinema that I've had. And there was never anything so socially elitist about it. People think it's elitist, it is because they haven't looked at it and haven't opened their mind. That would be my opinion. I was there in service of the films. And the films were wonderful and were able to lift people up. The idealism that, that particularly I showed and, and my, my passion for the cinema was something that I wasn't in any way embarrassed to express. It didn't bother me that people were like, oh, he's a bit of a lunatic, he's going on about these films. Because... I loved them, and I was doing it for uh, it's this MGM symbol that says "Ars Gratia Artis," art for art for art's sake. Well, I was doing it for the cinema's sake because I believed in this in the wonder of the cinema. I wanted, in a um, perhaps slightly evangelical way, to 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 take people from a position of not having seen something wonderful to having seen something wonderful, which they might remember to, for the rest of their lives. And uh, 
I think that was an immense privilege for me, but I hope it was also a privilege for them. Thank you.